climate change um, mitigation and adaptation. Um, and these are two really important concepts. I would really like to see more development of walkable cities, bikeable cities. For me, it really comes down to food. We have to learn about how food is created. I think, honestly, what's probably a bigger driver are insurance costs. Contact your local MP, um, contact Doug Ford if you want, because he's the one who's putting this project forward. You know, I want to take these discussions and really like apply them. residents. I resident. I live in uh, the Kemble area and um, I'm very passionate about climate change and climate activism. Um, I've been working with Climate Forum uh, for about three years now um, and have been proactive uh, in participating um, in meetings like this one. Um, as well as being a panelist. Um, I was a panelist for a leadership uh, meeting uh, last summer. So uh, that was really a great chance for me to talk about that. Um, and I also go to the University of Waterloo. I study environment resources and sustainability. Um, I'm also taking a minor in geography and a diploma in French. Um, so I really care about the environment and that's through showing through uh, my academic uh, studies and my program, as well as my activism at the local level uh, with the Climate Forum. Um, and uh, I'm also very uh, passionate about community building and uh, community building projects um, and have started tennis lessons um, in the area and uh, really care about uh, working with kids and um, having them uh, be outdoors and um, I'm on my co-op right now and uh, working as an outdoor education facilitator um, nearby the Guelph area. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about me in a nutshell, but uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, and these are two really important concepts that I think uh, that uh, I, I feel like I'm going to learn a, a few things tonight myself. Um, and I hope that you do too. And I hope that we can take our, uh, the lessons that we learned tonight from our panelists and uh, apply them to our neighborhood uh, in the Georgia Bluffs area um, and uh, spread the word about uh, these important points that uh, these panelists are gonna make tonight. My name is Lee and my family and I are settlers here in the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And although we're all meeting here virtually on the computers, we're all standing on traditional land. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, the land I'm standing on is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation. And that's the people of the three fires known as the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations. And I'd also like to give thanks to the Chippewa Newash Unceded First Nation and the Chippewa uh, the, uh They're now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, uh, the traditional keepers of this land. And uh, yeah, I respect you and your connection to nature. But uh, personally speaking from me, while a lot of my indigenous neighbors here around have been fighting for equality, uh, a lot of settlers like myself uh, have been busy building equity and I'm ever growing ever more aware of the inequality here in North America between um, our indigenous neighbors and ourselves and myself and also the systemic racism that exists. So um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna thank um, everyone involved in tonight, especially Hannah, um, who's been coordinating uh, and has done really great. Thanks so much, Lee. I really appreciate it. Um, so for our first panelist tonight, uh, we have my good friend um, and peer, uh, Eloise, um, and she is going to talk tonight um, about uh, mitigation. She is very passionate about uh, protecting the environment, and this is showing through her activism um, with Parks Canada, uh, where she uh, encourages students to explore the outdoors and be, out be outdoors. Um, and uh, she also is in the same program as me in Environment Resources and Sustainability, uh, where we uh, study a lot of uh, issues related to sustainability, as well as uh, climate change. So um, I will give the floor to her. 
Thank you, Eloise. Hi, everyone. Uh, bear with me for one second as I share my screen. So I'll be speaking about climate mitigation today. Um, so first, I'll just start with a brief description. So what is climate mitigation? So it refers to efforts to cut or prevent the emissions of greenhouse gases to limit the magnitude of climate change. Um, so you can do it one of two ways. You can either reduce carbon sources, so reduce sources of greenhouse gases. For example, the burning of fossil fuels for electricity, heat, and transport. Or you can enhance the sinks that hold um, those gases. So these can be oceans, soils, and forests. So why is climate mitigation important? It is crucial to take mitigation steps to reduce the severity of climate change and extreme weather events. Reducing greenhouse gases can lead to immediate improvements in the local environmental quality, for example, air quality, improvements in local public health and well-being, for example, reducing the incidence of asthma and upper respiratory diseases, water quality, and water quality improvement. Um, there are also economic benefits such as sustainable building practices, lower energy use, and accessible public transit. So I'll be going over a couple of examples uh, relating to climate change mitigation, uh, whether in the carbon sink or in the car carbon source um, section of it. So um, the first one is CO2 direct air capture. So this is a process in which fans capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere. The collected CO2 can be stored or reused as building materials or for fuel and energy. So this is one of the few technology options available to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. It can be an asset to certain industries that will have difficulty decarbonizing, for example, aviation. It should also be noted that direct air capture requires a lot of energy to power, so it would defeat the purpose to use fossil fuels to power this technology. So to make a difference for climate mitigation, the energy sources to power this technology should be renewable or net zero. Um, also, another note is that carbon removal technology should not be an alternative to cutting emissions or an excuse for delayed action. Um, so our next example is afforestation. So this refers to the establishment of a forest in areas that have not previously had tree cover to increase carbon capture. The types of land used can include areas turned to deserts, places that have been used for grazing, disused agricultural fields, or industrial areas. Benefits include carbon capture, improved soil quality, avoiding or reversing desertification, providing habitat for wildlife, and improved water quality. So this is a nature-based version of direct air capture. Um, and also another important thing to stress for climate mitigation is that we need to protect our carbon sinks. So for example, in Northern Ontario, we have these peatlands that store approximately 35 billion tons of carbon, which is equivalent to the annual emissions of 7 billion cars. Um, unfortunately, um, these peatlands are currently threatened by the proposed Ring of Fire mining development, which is located 540 kilometers southeast of Thunder Bay. So this mining development, if, if put in action, could generate $120 billion in revenue and nickel, which is what they would be mining, is hugely important for electric car batteries. However, this would impact the First Nation communities living in this area from downstream effects from the mining, and it would obviously impede on the carbon storing happening in this area. So protecting carbon sinks is often a push and pull between economic powers and environmental needs. And we see this a lot. Another example is the old growth logging in Ferry Creek in BC. Um, which, is, which is very unfortunate, but we definitely do need to protect these carbon sinks. And um, on that, in that same vein, 
um, indigenous land stewardship is extremely important. So according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, indigenous groups make up 5% of the global population, while their territories encompass 22% of the world's land surface and 80% of the planet's diversity. So indigenous peoples um, have a very important role in climate mitigation, and it is important to acknowledge that presence and that role. So we cannot achieve conservation and well-being for people and the planet unless we respect and value the rights of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people live in the, um, the rural area here on the call. So are you in Toronto? I'm in Ottawa. In Ottawa, okay. So mm -hmm. people in Ottawa, my question is, uh, people in Ottawa, how much do people talk about uh, direct air versus like nature-based solutions? That's an interesting question. Um, I couldn't tell you for all of Ottawa. No, I, um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mostly surround myself with other people who care about the environment. So maybe we talk about those things more. Yeah. So how do we raise the issue of the ring of fire um, in this uh, mining earth and metals? Uh, how do we raise this issue in the concept and in the concept context of the next election? Um, is the question from your the provincial election? Yeah, the upcoming provincial mm -hmm. election. How do we get this issue in the headlines? Um, I guess contact your local MP, um, contact Doug Ford if you want, because he's the one who's putting this project forward. There's also um, the Impact uh, Assessment Agency, which is the uh, agency, which is a branch of Environment and Climate Change Canada, which um, does these regional assessments and they they're doing a regional assessment for this project the ring of fire and if you actually go on their website and find this project you can submit comments um, and say i support this i want this to go ahead or no i don't support this and i don't want this to go ahead for these reasons and it's actually a really powerful way to um, give your comment and and have your voice heard thank you so much eloise that was a great presentation. And uh, so we're going to move on um, and talk to Chris um, about climate adaptation. So um, Chris's background related to the context of climate adaptation uh, stems from his uh, work um, working for uh, Amont Ontario um, as the asset manager. Um, and he works a lot on uh, green infrastructure projects. He is also a resident uh, in the uh, Georgian Bluffs area, so is familiar with the surroundings uh, in which we are, um, some of us are seated tonight. So uh, off to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, like Hannah said, I'm Chris Chen. I'm the executive director for, of Asset Management Ontario, and that's an organization that works directly with municipalities and other public sector organizations with their infrastructure planning. And the field is called asset management. And what that is about in, in plain speak is generating as much value as from what you own. And, and that's deceptively simple because it's about balancing costs, risks, performance, and sustainability. It's also very complex because every municipality, and that's primarily who I work directly with, every municipality offers a broad range of services to residents, roads, water, wastewater, libraries, community centers. And typically, this field has just been about what they call gray infrastructure. But over the past several years, the focus on climate change has been two big developments. The focus on climate change is one of them. And, um, and the second, and, and it's climate change, as, as Eloise talked about, reducing greenhouse gas, gases or the mitigation part of that, or the mitigation part of climate change action is hugely important, but just as important is ensuring that our communities are resilient to climate impacts. And that's really the purview of climate adaptation. This is a forum that was organized by youth, by people like Hannah. And, um, and when we look at sort of the arc of, of the gray Bruce County area, what we know is that the, the uh, climate is changing significantly. On a day-to-day -day basis, you may not notice that, but over stretches of time, the changes are forecast to be significant. 
And so the forecasts from Environment and Climate Change Canada indicate that it will rain significantly more and that it'll get quite a bit hotter in the Grey Bruce area. Um, and these changes will impact the way that municipalities deliver services and budget for them. It'll also affect you as taxpayers. So it's reasonable to expect that with a lot more precipitation that there's gonna be more flooding scenarios and shorelines washing out. Uh, and that affects roads and transportation and, and, and so forth. Um, with more ex extreme heat days, that means there's gonna be a greater reliance on using energy like air conditioning to cool ourselves during summer months. So what exactly is climate adaptation? Um, it's a term that is, is, it's a term that actually often gets mixed in with, with uh, mitigation, um, but adaptation is really, has more to do with how we deal with the impacts of a changing climate on our systems. And when we talk about systems, we're talking about the ecological systems, social systems, and economic systems. And in some ways, at, um, at climate adaptation is really a form of risk management. And it's a, a form of risk management that encompasses your processes, your habits, your practices, your structures that are all geared to reduce the potential adverse impact associated with climate change. So when you think about adaptation on a system level, and the system can be like a municipality, it can be an area like Gray Bruce, you're really considering three things. You're considering what the vulnerability, like the extent to which, let's say, the ecological system or the, or the community is susceptible to adverse impacts and not able to cope with them. You're also talking about things like resilience. That's kind of like informally the amount of give in the system or the amount of change the system can undergo without changing its state. Um, and then the third thing is what's the capacity to adapt? And that's really the potential of your system to successfully respond to climate variability and change. When we talk about, when we talk about adaptation, um, adaptation can be proactive or reactive. This is not just for climate change adaptation, it's for any kind of adaptation. But more importantly, it's, 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 it's useful to note that institutions can adapt reactively or proactively. So an example of a reactive climate adaptation is let's say there's a flooding incident and, and your, your, your basement gets flooded. And you, so you pump or remove the water from your flooded rooms. You haven't, you haven't necessarily prevented this from happening again, but you've taken care of the immediate situation. This tends to be costly and time consuming. Um, the real gold star, if you will, for adaptation is, is what's called proactive adaptation. And, and when we think about proactive adaptation, we think about that in, in a couple of dimensions. You think about it in terms of being able to predict uh, adverse events and then to take steps to reduce their potential impacts. That's of course the more thoughtful approach. It's also in some ways a harder approach because you have to be a lot more organized and you have to really be much more coordinated in terms of different types of expertise and people working together. Um, but it's a more thoughtful approach because you can consider how investments can achieve multiple benefits. These are sometimes called co-benefits. So one of the most promising areas of proactive climate adaptation relates to green infrastructure. And green infrastructure is, is a, effectively a form of infrastructure planning that uh, it, it's, that is really, it means a couple, encompasses a couple of things. It encompasses the, nat, the world of your natural assets. That's all the things that you're familiar with, your trees, your forests, your wetlands, your marshes. Um, but it also encompasses what's sometimes called low impact development. So that in, can include a category called enhanced natural assets like bioswales or rain gardens or stormwater ponds as well as engineered assets, which is like things like permeable pavement and rain barrels. You have to remember that, that, that infrastructure and, and assets are meant to provide services. And all of this previously was done with what they called gray infrastructure. So the hard engineered assets, the uh, impervious kinds of roads and things like that. So what you're doing with the idea of green infrastructure is to try to to achieve the same levels kinds of services, but also achieving other benefits, co-benefits, like 
a more beautiful environment, greater access to green spaces and so forth. So to give you a few examples of these different categories. So Gray Bruce has a lot of wetlands and those are, it's actually, I think the, um, the topic for the February discussion for the sustainability forum. And, um, and so, but wetlands provide critical infrastructure services to res residents. Uh, this is apart from, from their natural features. And from an infrastructure perspective, they play a critical role in the retention of rainwater, which is then filtered and then slowly released into the groundwater system. So this is important because it contributes to excellent quality well water and wells are so important for so many of us in Grand Bruce counties. And so without services like these wetlands and the, and the nearby woodlands, rainwater would quickly run off into streams and rivers. You'd have increased flooding, groundwater levels would drop, and it'd be probably harder to obtain uh, well water or certainly um, the well water would be probably a poorer quality. So another example of, 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 of of a different category of green infrastructure called enhanced natural assets are green roofs. And so this picture is of Lakeside Park in Mississauga. And, and the primary benefit is it maximizes something called evapotranspiration for water balance targets. It also supports biodiversity and it's a nice amenity. Um, our family during uh, the Christmas season was in Mississauga and was walking through this park. And that's one of the features of the park uh, in, in, in the urbanized area. A third, a third category was as engineered assets. And so um, there's something called permeable pavers or permeable pavement. This picture is actually from Kitchener, the city of Kitchener. And these are important. The purpose of, of permeable pavement uh, is to help with that reestablish a more natural hydrologic balance and to reduce runoff volume. And it does that by basically, you'll see that the water goes in between the cracks into basically a reservoir that uh, releases the precipitation into the ground instead of allowing it to flow into storm drains um, and out to our lakes and rivers as effluent. So, and so you compare that to conventional impervious pavement that allows storm water to drain through the surface um, and, and, um, uh, and, and just, and, and causes more flooding kinds of issues. So those are three local examples uh, of, of green infrastructure that have been used in Ontario municipalities. So, so this is really in some ways just a primer. And so what can you do? And, and um, the first thing that, that you can do is you can learn more about this area. And it's not all it's not a magic solution. There are there is a lot of complexity involved with infrastructure planning, understanding the extent of potentially adverse impacts, the timing of those impacts, the distribution of those impacts, the cost, the life cycle management. So it's not an it's not a it's there 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 is a lot of consideration goes into this. But as as residents of the Gray Bruce area, there are certain things that you can do, and it's it's great to be part of this community because. You can, you can go to your local municipality and ask them about the, what's the role of green infrastructure when they, when, in their planning process. Do they actually consider green infrastructure options at the very inception of their planning? Um, you can inquire about your municipality's approach. You can go to council, you can talk to staff about how they adapt their infrastructure related services to potential climate impacts. Maybe there's a climate strategy at your municipality and those would be appropriate ways to really raise these issues and collaborate with some local staff. You can let councils know, I mean, we talk about green infrastructure, but the most important part of green infrastructure is really conservation of your natural assets because there's nothing, there, there, there's, there's, there's nothing that, that in some ways that's, that's what's really irreplaceable. Um, you can let your councils know that you value conservation and low impact development as part of smart community planning. And, and you can sort of ask about the way that they manage their asset manage the way that they practice asset management and whether they incorporate green infrastructure solutions as part of their, the way they talk about risk management or levels of service. Um, and the final point is that you can advocate for 
opportunities to realize co-benefits associated with green infrastructure before or when a municipality is in the stages of, of planning for major construction. When they're tearing out roads, for example, there's usually a lot of impacts on the environment, and that's often a way for to really engage some of these issues. Um, the last thing I'll leave people with are a couple of good resources. The uh, Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition has a resources page. It's a, it's a great way to sort of learn more uh, about different things. Um, and the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program called STEP um, has a lot of excellent resources as well. Um, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, risk management is something uh, we most associate with large companies and uh, municipalities, but getting thinking about it and seeing your examples, uh, you know, like even if you're a wedding planner or even just as a homeowner, like this is all stuff you can incorporate. Um, but I appreciate also your takeaway of uh, advocate, advocating. There's uh, a couple of questions. The first question is, uh, from Peter is wondering what type of development you think most municipalities would take notice of um, when it comes to infrastructure. Um, I think it really depends on on what you mean by take notice of. Councils and, and municipal staff are often really, their work is often shaped by, by what they hear from stakeholders. And in development and planning, the loudest voice is often the developers. So you often hear things from their perspective. I think it can be hugely valuable when you have residents and get at, a, at a grassroots level, the community engaging in, in talking about the planning process in more holistic terms, in terms of uh, co-benefits, in terms of, of how we're, you're conserving nature, how you're really beautifying the environment, how you're providing more access to green spaces and things like that, how you're able to address some of these services that you would typically do with gray infrastructure, with potentially with green infrastructure and asking them to do uh, studies or, or to do to provide analyses about that. And a municipality should be able to do that. They may not necessarily do that naturally um, or by of their own volition without some prodding because it's most people who are in this business have been trained in a certain way. They do gray infrastructure, they take care of roads they take care of buildings, and that's kind of what they do. So, you as a so uh, that's that's actually very important. The second point that's actually very important, and I think this relates to the theme of your of your session in March, has to do with collaboration. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of groups of people, of of activists, of people who really care about the environment, of of different groups with overlapping interests. The more that you collaborate and raise those issues to council. In, a, in an integrated kind of way, the more powerful that voice is or those set of, sets of concerns are. Um, so, so in an ideal world, to Peter's question, the, the best kind of planning really happens when it reflects, truly reflects the broader values of, of the community. And that's a very complex thing in terms of, uh, in terms of the range of benefits that people expect in communities. It is, it is exactly um, if you uh, and by the way, speaking of collaboration, um, if you all know about any green infrastructure projects around this area um, that need support. Um, that's one of the things we do as well. We collect info on the projects that are going on green roofs, etc permeable paving and uh, we actually co we collaborate between them all it's a it's an association called or it's a it's a it's a project called Lake Huron forever. And uh, the jurisdiction is the whole Lake Huron shoreline. Uh, so, it's, so yeah, uh, get in touch with us if um, if you have projects that need support as well. That's a that's a really quite a coincidence actually. Maybe you've been maybe you've been looking at our website, Chris. <laughs> the the second question for you is um, is about the data, the infrastructure data that municipalities stare at. Do you have a cost benefit versus the traditional infrastructure data that often comes up as a barrier in talking with municipalities? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of the cost benefit data is for specific projects. Um, and so, and I think that the sector is kind of building up those individual projects and getting a lot of data from individual projects, but it's not like the way people run roads or, or build roads where there's just a huge amount of data and they can estimate, they can, they have, they have averages for rural, rural areas of, of, 
uh, of that have these kinds of temperatures, they know exactly how long the road's going to last. And that kind of lack of certainty is currently a bit can be a bit of a barrier for municipalities because um, municipalities are very conservative creatures uh, in terms of by habit, by by this by by the way that they typically often run. Um, and if if there's uncertainty around around, for example, life cycle costing for um, let's say you do, um, you know, you're exploring alternatives to stormwater runoff. Um, the data, the long range data is not necessarily there, but it is growing. It's growing on the academic side and it's growing when you tap into associations that do this work like GEO, like Green Infrastructure Ontario or STEP or a lot of the conservation authorities have, have, have some pretty good data about this. So it's a growing area, but the thing is as, as a resident, you can ask the municipality for that. That's their responsibility. That's staff's responsibility to get that. You as a resident are, are articulating that you're really concerned about, um, you know, the, the, the green access to green, equitable issues around like equity around access to green spaces and, and so forth. And, um, and, and that's something that the municipality should be able to respond to. Okay. Well, that was uh, the third question. The bonus question from Joachim was how do you move a city forward towards a, a municipal adaptation plan that's a bit more broad because he says that Owen Sound has adopted one that's just corporate admissions. Uh, municipal infrastructure excludes like your homes and gardens, et cetera. So do you have a comment on that or should we uh, hold off on that question until the end? It's a good question because it, climate impacts as, as Eloise talked about, as I've talked about, um, cut across boundaries. Um, and it's just not, it doesn't just stop at, you know, the boundaries of Georgian Bluffs or city or going sound or so forth. And so, but I think the way a municipality would look at that kind of a question is that it doesn't necessarily have the jurisdiction um, to really force homeowners to do X or Y in terms of, of um, in terms of uh, how to adapt their residences. I think honestly, what's probably a bigger driver are insurance costs, uh, residential or homeowner insurance costs, because they're going way up, um, and uh, and and uh, what you might find is that in some in some municipalities in some areas that are on, and for a lot of homes on some floodplains, they're not even there's a becoming uninsurable, or becoming so expensive that that they're actually becoming prohibitive to to live in. So that's actually probably a bigger driver than that. Um, the other thing I'd probably say to Joachim is, is that um, you have groups um, like the Intact Center at the University of Waterloo that have made some excellent recommendations about how homeowners can become can adapt to potential floods and things like that in fairly low cost, high impact ways. And so what you're finding municipalities do is they're including those instructions in their tax flyers. But that's not a but that's not a requirement for a municipality to do that. Wonderful, um, yeah. I uh, I have a link to an article that I will send later um, that uh, can link you to the Intact Center um, and a recent uh, document that they came out about uh, uh, climate adaptation. Um, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, and now we will. Uh, move on to our final uh, panelist of the night. Um, his name is Peter, um, and he is a local resident of the Great Bruce area. Um, he has taught himself, himself many of the um, environmental practices that um, is showcased in his home. Um, it is quite something. Um, I'm really excited to learn about it tonight. Um, and uh, he will run us through uh, some nature-based solutions um, that he has adopted um, in his home. Um, and uh, he also works um, as an outdoor education uh, person at uh, uh, the Blue Water Outdoor Education Center. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Peter, and off to you. All right, so yeah, Burzas Garden Farm. We have, uh, my wife Erin and I uh, co steward it, and we have tried a lot of these funny ideas um, or futuristic ideas, depending on how you look at them. Uh, we have five green roofs, uh, we're off grid. Um, we have one bioswale, we have an experimental planting of Southern, quote unquote, Southern loving uh, tree species, and we'll see what happens as, as time progresses. Um, 
So a lot of the uh, solutions to climate change seemed to me to be really germane to uh, where we live in Great Bruce. And uh, I mean, every, every municipality and community and, and home has a part to play with mechanical attacks against uh, you know, accumulating carbon. But um, there's a lot of land-based things that I certainly didn't grow up uh, learning about and are really exciting. <laughs> so that's, that's what I wanna uh, focus on mostly. One quote I really like that I just came across is the capacity of soil to capture carbon is essentially unlimited which is just a fantastic, uh, a fantastic concept. A lot of my concepts and, and data um, uh, come from a, a, a book and a project called Project Drawdown. Uh, in 2017, they got together and released a book, which, which was a, a ambitious way to attack uh, climate change and carbon sequestration. And um, their numbers, um, they looked at a way to, to uh, take care of a thousand gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. And they studied all these ways and had experts for each one. Um, and I looked at about 200 gigatons worth as ones that really could be approached within Gray Bruce uh, in terms of nature-based solutions. Um, so that's, that's what my following slides get at. Number 11 in all of their 80 solutions uh, was civil pasture, 26.6 gigatons. And that's just incorporating livestock and trees together in a, uh, a purposeful way. It's not just letting animals run into the forest and do what they want. It's uh, managing them and the trees so that both benefit and that carbon is trapped well. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, my favorite figure in this world is a man named Mark Shepard. He runs New Forest Farm and Forest Agriculture Enterprises in Wisconsin. Great book. He's all over the internet and YouTube, and uh, he puts pigs mostly on his farm, but not exclusively. And they do work for him. Uh, uh, something Eloise mentioned was afforestation, taking uh, degraded lands and making them more functional, more beautiful, more biodiverse, trapping more carbon. Uh, a key figure in all this is Akira Mirawaki, sorry, Miyawaki. And uh, through his planting styles, it's been discovered that you can get something that approaches an old growth forest, old growth forest 10 times faster and with 30 times more density and 20 times more biodiversity. And we can do that in certain places in, in Grey Bruce for sure. Uh, we're blessed, of course, as most of you know, that we have uh, a fair bit of temperate, uh, temperate forest, but we can restore what we've got to have more biodiversity, more uh, vertical levels of solar panels that we also call leaves. And uh, the thing that's not well known is how excellent cool temperate forests are at capturing carbon relative to some other types of forests. So in, in a sense, we live in a hot spot in terms of our, our regional forests being excellent trappers. Uh, also poorly <laughs> understood is how managed animal livestock grazing can trap carbon very well. And again, it's, it's not the uh, traditional way necessarily of livestock farming. You don't just turn the cattle out under the field and let them go where they will, when they will, for how long they will. You have to manage them as if you are an apex predator to keep them moving and to keep the health of the pasture uh, at peak, peak productivity. Uh, another one, perennial staple crops. The uh, aforementioned uh, Mark Shepard, he has a great quote. He, he was at... Uh, uh, sort of a green conference he was teaching. Uh, everyone was talking about the wonderful work they were doing with their gardens and all the salads they were eating, which is which is fair point. But the point he brought up was that's great, but most of the calories all of us consume aren't salad based. They're uh, staple crops, they're carbohydrates, they're coming from wheats and rices and corns, and we need perennial crops to provide a bigger share of our diet because you don't have to plow for them. They're always planted if they're chestnut trees like they are in Southern Europe and Corsica. And uh, it's just a fascinating field that we'll have to go into another time. Uh, intercropping is a little more easy to understand. Trees and crops together. There can be net biological productivity. Um, of course, you might have less corn uh, than you would otherwise, but not as much as you might think. Uh, you might have less 
tree cover than you would <laughs> if you didn't have corn or another crop beside them, but it's, uh, it's mutually beneficial generally. Another area is regenerative annual cropping or conservation agriculture. And uh, that's not an area I'm an expert in, but uh, if you're very curious about this angle, Gabe Brown is a, is a man who's fantastic at it. He's got a book called Dirt to Soil. He's on YouTube everywhere. And the idea is uh, keep the soil covered all the time. You trap more carbon and more water that way. And there's different ways of, of attacking that. Another one which um, Eloise referred to, I think a little bit was, uh, we can restore abandoned farmland and there's a lot of it. Uh, I, I, one quote I just heard was that there is an area worldwide the size of the continental United States, including Alaska, that is former farmland, which is now doing not much. And it's tempting to think that, well, that's okay. Nature will cover herself and trap carbon. But that's only occasionally true. In fact, I would hazard a guess the minority of the time uh, a lot of times um, ecological farming can uh, be more <laughs> carbon trapping than mother nature left to her own, especially in arid sections of the world uh, where we live not as much, but it's, it's a fascinating, um, it's a fascinating uh, subject to study a little bit, as well as giving local people more livelihood if it's a local area that's being um, worked on again. This is maybe more, the last one was maybe more a uh, thought for Gray County. This was more for Bruce County. We have big, huge uh, agricultural fields, which are very productive, but they're productive in one, you know, one sense, one crop. And we can layer the levels and have more than one crop on one piece of land and increase carbon capture and increase water retention and stabilize climate and soils and a lot of good things. Again, the picture on the right is from Mark Shepard, uh, his new forest farm and the biological diversity that has uh, happened on his farm has just gone through the roof. It was formerly just a corn and soy field, uh, gullied, eroded, and now it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a paradise essentially <laughs> in Wisconsin with the climate and soils not too different from ours. This might be more in, uh, in, in Chris's uh, municipal wheelhouse, but uh, methane di digesters are something I think have to be looked at and some farmers are looking at them. And of course, if you can use the, uh, the energy produced on site, you don't have to transport it. It's a lot more efficient. And uh, yeah, methane is a big, a big topic. Uh, Eloise referred to this as well, Indigenous Peoples Forest tenure. Uh, we always hear about uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, proclivity to think in terms of seven, seven generations and that really is the key. But long term thinking it's not swayed. Decisions aren't swayed as much by politics and four year uh, election cycles and development uh, development interests necessarily. Uh, forest protection, of course, we want to do it. We have to do it. We want to do it uh, in traditional ways. And, and when I'm saying traditional, I mean, if we have beautiful older growth forests, we want to protect that. But it's also very interesting that um, there are a lot of ancient forest stewardship techniques, which are largely forgotten in modern times, but can create uh, more biodiversity than, quote unquote, a lot of climax forests. Uh, you can coppice uh, trees and shrubs, uh, as you see the, the picture on the left, and uh, that can provide food for animals and it can provide um, habitat for uh, wildlife, especially insects that are not able to stand the conditions of the interior dark forest. And the trees and shrubs can often, uh, oftentimes live longer. Um, in fact, until 1900, at least in Northern Europe, there, were, uh, there was more animal food, animal fodder from trees than there was from hay. This is another super interesting subject that is only <laughs> coming to the light um, after many, many decades of being turned under, literally. Grassland protection, this is becoming increasingly understood, but it's been poorly understood for a long time. And we do have grasslands in Grey Bruce. We do have, in some areas, natural grasslands in Grey Bruce. And uh, grasses, of course, and, and forbs and other plants trap a lot of carbon, 
underground, but they have to be managed to be most biologically productive, which usually needs to include animals in some sort. And of course we can all compost and even make biochar. I've done a little bit of both. It's uh, really interesting um, putting carbon literally into your compost, into your garden soil or potting soil or whatever. And uh, terra preta in the Amazon, that's how a lot of the Amazonian uh, indigenous populations survive for uh, hundreds of years by enriching their uh, traditionally poor soil with char and clay and making these incredibly fertile fertile areas of production that are still discernible um, today. Big, big issue that I, I don't necessarily trust these numbers, 2.3 gigatons of carbon is nitrogen fertilizers. Um, it's very commonly understood that methane is bad. Obviously, obviously carbon in the atmosphere is, you know, uh, at bad levels, but methane is, you know, very bad because it's uh, 10 times as potent. But soil bacteria converting nitrate fertilizers into nitrous oxide is 300 times more powerful than uh, straight carbon going to the atmosphere. So when we have runoffs, they don't just uh, cause algal blooms in Lake Erie and green slime in the, in the ditches of Grey Bruce. Uh, it does, they're very heavy hitters in the atmosphere. And uh, of course, a lot of these techniques I've mentioned beforehand, uh, if we're using those, those uh, varied plantings and landscape types are gonna intercept this excess nitrogen before it ever gets close to a large body of water. And some of the plants would probably grow faster as, as well. Biomass power and perennial biomass production. I don't know um, what, uh, experience Chris has with this kind of uh, approach, I'd be curious, but uh, it seems to me to be um, a way of creating power. It's probably a bridge solution. Uh, where we live east of the Mississippi, we do find that trees like to grow fast and we could harvest those for uh, fuel or electricity. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be great to uh, find other ways of production as well. And I think this is my last main slide. It's funny, I have the same actual picture as Chris <laughs> on the left there, a, a gray Bruce wetland. And it just reminded me of a place where I work, so I had, I had to use it. And then uh, I've got a fan on the right, which is beautiful to walk in. And uh, it's a little bit like some of the peatlands that uh, Eloise talked about early on. But uh, wetlands, whether they're a river delta or just a lot of standing water, trap a lot of carbon uh, in their soils and cattail marshes. And uh, we have a lot of those gray bruce, not as many as we uh, used to, but um, it's still something to protect. Um, I just threw in a couple of resources with a picture of my bioswale and tree berm. And uh, <laughs> on the right, there's a picture of what we call a dead hedge. We had to do some hedgerow prunings to put a livestock fence through. And well, we weren't going to burn all the, all the brush. We put some hedges in the ancient style to snow, catch dust and build soil and allow the uh, top soil layer to grow so we can plant trees to trap carbon and yada, yada, yada. And I've got resources below from a lot of this talk. I think that's it, yeah. That's an awesome, awesome presentation. And I just love how you um, wear, your, uh, wear your emotions on your sleeve when you talk about uh, bridge solutions uh, and, uh, and et cetera, like the, um, and uh, fertilizer. So uh, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really nice to, to get the, the big picture of all the solutions from you um, at this time. We're all sort of, you know, people that are, are busy are always sort of looking for something that they can advocate for. Um, and you've offered so many in your presentation um, from farm, farmland to what have you, um, to seven generation thinking. Um, but what is, uh, what, is one or, what are the one or two things that people with busy lives that are running their kids out to, to school buses and stuff, what are, what are the things that we could do that may not own farmland or, or have access to tree planting? Yeah, I, th I think we wanna support people who are doing these things. So whether that's uh, supporting Eat Local Grey Bruce, uh, you know, regional um, organic or, you know, veggie box farmers, farmers markets, um, 
uh, everybody can compost and make biochar actually and uh, bury that carbon in their in their yard in one form or another. Uh, it's you can do it at a, a ridiculous number of scales, both of those composting and biochar production. Um, it, it for me, it really comes down to food. We have to learn about how food is created. And I grew up. My father had some livestock, but we lived in the city and I didn't know anything about food or how food was made and I didn't learn it in university. I didn't really learn it since I almost had to learn it kicking and screaming. <laughs> but uh, the, the thing that's I have a lot of contacts who took environmental studies in university and it can be a depressing topic and subject uh, study at times. The more I've learned about ecological farming and, and regenerative agriculture, the more exciting it is. And uh, you just have to do a little research to figure out how you fit in best. Nice. Thank you. And Kay would like to know if there's any land trusts or conservation conservation organizations in Grey Bruce. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, there's a number of organizations. One's called ALUS, A-L-U-S, which stands for Alternative Land Use Services. Uh, there is a Grey Bruce chapter. It started, I believe, in Ontario in Norfolk County and they're doing some great work there. So they've taken uh, quote unquote marginal farmland and restored some tall grass prairie to it, uh, that kind of thing. I, I know there's um, a number of uh, projects in Grey Bruce and there's actually a regional coordinator, Keith Reed, is it? R-E-I-D, yeah. Um, but in terms of land trust, yeah, we have a lot to learn from um, the UK, I think, specifically, where they have agrarian trusts. So uh, when the landowner or controller or steward passes away, they want that land uh, kept as a, uh, a piece of land that is producing you know, food, fiber, medicine or fuel for, for humans as well as whatever, whatever wildlife. Um, that's, a, that's a big topic I, I want to learn more about myself. I think one question that I would have for all three of you. Let me think about how to phrase this. How do I you- steal, I must have stolen your question. Yeah. I answered it, I asked it to Peter. Did I steal your question? A little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> I, think, I think my question is, is given the complexity of, of climate change and the adaptation and mitigation strategies that we need to have, how can like cities like Owen Sound collaborate with other municipalities um, who might have, you know, different levels of um, of adaptation and mitigation that they need to do, um, and how can we really like proactively work together? Would it be smart to have like a? Would it be better to have at like the community scale, or would it be better to have like a citywide collaboration on on these type of issues? It's a terrific question because it recognizes that a lot of these these problems are cross-cutting and they're common, yet they're cross-cutting. And so it makes sense in a more ideal world to share resources, to share uh, whether it's money or, or, or expertise to solve and address these issues. Um, at, a, at a municipal staff level, there are communities of practice uh, on certain issues, climate issues, infrastructure issues, where they people share and share best practices and um, share knowledge and learning. Um, but by and large, those are not formal, those are not, um, they're, they're not the, they're not, they don't have any binding authority. Um, a lot of industry or, or industry associations should play that kind of a role. So there are different municipal associations or associations that um, uh, for people who work on, for, for example, parks and forests and, and recreation to deal with some of those cross-cutting issues. But what you, I think you're asking and that hasn't been done is what would a, a regional governance model look like that is actually resource to attack some of these problems and a lot of the way that our governments are structured uh, in terms of the three tiers of government is not necessarily the ideal way to address some of these kinds of issues that are, that are shared and cross-cutting. But we have to make do with what we have. 
Yeah, because, you know, I, I feel like I learned, I learned a lot tonight and I feel like, um, you know, I want to take these discussions and really like apply them uh, to the world around us. So um, I think it's really important to keep that in mind as we have these type of discussions that um, something comes about from them, um, given that these are real world problems that we're facing and uh, real things that um, like more people need to be enlightened by. So um, yeah, I think uh, the more and more we work together and talk about these things in the community, the more, the more change uh, can occur. Um, and, and not, you know, collaboration is hugely important, but collaboration also takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of um, trust, building trust and, and, and goodwill um, to be done effectively. And even if you, for, I know there's a couple of like Hannah and Eloise are in university. Like, even if you were to think about the clubs that you're part of, if you were to try to do it on a, on a inter-university basis, and then where would you start in terms of doing that? It would, you need to find the right people. You need to find supportive uh, administrators at different universities, people who are aligned in their vision. So, it so really, yeah, really comes so, down to the budget as well, right? The, that's right. The that's right. Is key and, and what people like, like you were talking about in your, in your presentation on adaptation, like uh, what services are being provided, like are, you know, are, is more money going and in investing into healthcare um, and things like that, as opposed to um, climate change, because those things are equally important, I would say, um, depending on people's circumstances. So yeah, I think it's just like a budget, people who are interested and people who can stay accountable to uh, taking those actions. Uh, around the ring of fire uh, problem, um, I was just wondering like, what, what is your opinion on um, electric cars um, and that like offsetting carbon emissions? Because on one hand, it's, it's, it's seen as a good thing to have an electric car because that way you are uh, reducing your carbon emissions. Um, on the other hand, you've also exacerbated climate change in a way because um, the mining that went into um, uh, finding the resource for the for the batteries, uh, you emitted uh, carbon in that process. So what's kind of your opinion on that? <laughs> I am not a car person. And as much as I am an environmentalist, the electric car debate is not particularly something that interests me, but recently I've really been getting interested and learning about walkable cities and um, the 15 minute city is what it's called. I recently went to New York and I was so, I was just so happy that you can just walk anywhere. You can take the subway anywhere. Um, and I was then, you know, a little bit upset that where I live, you have to drive if you want to go anywhere. And it's not a very pleasant walk. Sometimes there's no sidewalks, biking around the city is not that safe. Um, so in the car debate, I would really like to see more development of walkable cities, bikeable cities, and then cars like like Caminoto is a really common car rental service if you want to go out of the city for the weekend. But um, I really would like to live in like one of those walkable cities, but unfortunately the demand for those is so high. So they're really not accessible. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting concept because I think like in the city of Owen Sound, it's, it's quite accessible. Um, I would say like, uh, it's really easy to like walk to the grocery store and uh, things like that. Um, but then we also have people who live on like the outskirts of Owen Sound and uh, people who live in Kemble, people who live um, in Annan and, um, and uh, these are areas that are a little bit farther away from the central city. And the only mode of tra transportation um, is really driving a car. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're going <laughs> to kayak into town and <laughs> pick up your groceries or um, it's also possible to bike. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's challenging trying to figure out more local ways of making a walkable city. And I think it, 
narrows down to even uh, more community level talking with your neighbors um, at mm -hmm. that point, instead of relying on, you know, uh, maybe the municipal government to create change on, at that point. A comment earlier about collaboration be uh, between different levels of governments. So Grey County is coming up soon, or maybe has ratified now their climate action plan, and that includes roundtables and, and so on. But one issue that comes up often is that because I, 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 from, I work with the climate action team on sound and we work with the city, that they often have this argument they wouldn't do things in terms of mitigation and adaptation because they don't want to duplicate uh, actions. So because the, the, the county may do something, but that it, it's kind of a seesaw thing where at, at the end, Nothing happens because everybody is waiting for the other um, level of government to, to, to do something. I'm not sure if anybody has a kind of a, a, a thought about that, but that's one of the frustrations that we are dealing with here. I, I just think what Chris said earlier about the insurance industry being uh, having real leverage, I think that's, that's really insightful and it, that inside and um, pinch point has to be actively um, mined, <laughs> pursued, strategized by folks who wanna trap carbon also. Yeah. Yeah, we know that, uh, that, that every time there's a flood, it costs about $40,000 on average. The difficulty is thing to foresee and to predict what kind of um, climate, climate issues we will have in the future. This, this was a great evening and really complex and, and compact uh, uh, discussions and contributions. I thank you all so much for that. It, it's so important that we talk together, like that we talk as communities, uh, not just politicians or not just people who are in, in the field. I think it's a conversation that needs to be all over. That's one reason why we have a an Earth Day event on Saturday where we invite um, all the communities. Uh, it's for kids and there's a concert and parade and so on, which we actually try just to, to connect people because connection is so important. If everybody just sits at home and is wondering what could we do or get depressed because things are not, not moving forward, that doesn't lead to anything. It leads to more depression, basically. Say so thanks again to everybody, particularly to Hannah, who wonderfully got all of us together and moderated the, the conversations. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye.